I'm Trans Canada CEO Russ Gurley. They said it couldn't be done. Building an oil pipeline that cut right through America's heartland. I guess we proved them wrong. Yippee! <laughs> and to think that all it took was a little old-fashioned lying. Like when we told the American people it would be good for the economy. Well, <laughs> Keystone is only going to drive the price of oil up! <laughs> oh, but wait! This is my favorite part. We said the Keystone Pipeline was going to increase American oil independence. You want to see who it's really going to increase oil independence for? <laughs> Bless America. I love it when things start out like that. That's a counter to all those shiny, happy ads that TransCanada is putting out. And if you look on the Facebook page, they got busted for putting solar panels on a Keystone prom uh, promotion on the sidebar. Oh, my goodness. We've got that at our Facebook group at Radio Free Canada. We've also got a YouTube channel. I'm Darren Howard. And I'm Robert Nisbet. Let's talk about some oil spills that they don't want us talking about. You're tuned in to Video Radio. An oil leak near Cold Lake continues to spill nearly two months after it started. CNRL, the company that operates the site, is now opening it up to the media for a tour. The questions remain about why it took so long and why oil continues to flow. Our provincial affairs reporter Vashi Capellos has more. Well, I'm here on the Cold Lake First Nation, which is about an hour away from where the oil is spilling right now. Now, people here, the Dene people here, are very concerned about what's happening an hour away, and that's because their traditional territory is situated right on the four spill sites. Now, those spill sites, the earliest one was reported to the energy regulator at the end of May. The fourth and final one was reported at the end of June. The issue is that oil continues to seep at all four sites. That's what the regulator says. According to the company, while it continues to seep, it has been contained. However, that's not doing much to assure people on this First Nation. The Denny people here are still very concerned about the effects of this spill. From a containment perspective, um, on the water one, we have containment boom and uh, a special curtain that's designed that basically goes from the surface of the water all the way into the substrate of the water body, so it can't flow laterally. So from a containment perspective, it can't continue to flow laterally and, and impact larger areas. So it's contained right to where it's seeping out. Now, according to the company, 6,600 barrels or 1 million litres of oil has so far seeped into the environment around the sites. There's still a lot of concern here at this First Nation because a lot of the spill has to do with the type of technology that's being used at that site. It's called in situ technology. Dene people here at this First Nation want that technology halted, the process there halted, until they can figure out whether or not things are about to get worse. In Cold Lake, Vashi Capellos, Global News. I so like it when they say the official source is actually a reliable source of information. Yeah, I was looking for his tell. <laughs> You're tuned in to Radio Free Canada. The pipeline is the problem, and that's what we're focusing on for the next 15 minutes or the next 12 minutes anyways. But they're talking about another pipeline. Yes, they're talking about another pipeline. So get ready to get your signs to get in the streets. You've got it right here at Radio Free. For energy giant TransCanada, this mega project is more than a mega business deal. It's being hailed as a nation bill. It's a $12 billion proposal to move crude oil from Alberta east across six provinces. The plan includes converting 3,000 kilometres of existing natural gas pipeline and building 1,400 kilometres more. Refineries in New Brunswick and Quebec have always paid a premium for oil because it had to be shipped in from countries like Saudi Arabia and Libya. This project could reverse that trend. Irving Oil is partnering with TransCanada. It wants to build a $300 million deep water marine terminal in St. John to ship Alberta oil overseas. The pipeline will also deliver Canada crude to two in ports John. in Quebec. And we have an opportunity to replace crude that is coming from other parts of the world with Canadian crude, improving our national security, energy security, and creating great paying jobs here in New Brunswick and right across Canada. It's expected to create thousands of jobs, but the exact number isn't clear. 
nor is the benefit to consumers, but eliminating Eastern Canada's reliance on imported crude could drive down the cost of everything from gas to home heating oil. TransCanada's newest project is its biggest ever, but the company says Energy East isn't a backup plan for its other controversial pipeline, Keystone XL. TransCanada's ambitious plan isn't a done deal yet. It still needs regulatory approval, but the company hopes the oil will start flowing to Quebec in four years and to New Brunswick a year later in 2018. So, of course, they're saying it's it's safe and it's going to create jobs again. Yeah, they really believe that? I mean, it's like weapons of mass destruction or, you know, this, this oil spill isn't so bad. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it's more pipelines, more problems. Yes, more pipelines and more problems. You know, I wish we had another pipeline story from the recent history oh, oh, that would show us the problem. Oh, wait, we do. Just a couple hours east of Detroit, one Michigan beer company is causing a big stink over the Inbridge tar sands pipeline. Bell's Brewery says the oil company's plans to build a pollution facility just a few hundred feet away from the brewery will affect the water and put a bad odor into the air. Now it's suing. Here's how we got to this point. Back in 2010, an Inbridge pipeline burst, spilling over 1 million gallons of Canadian crude oil into the Kalamazoo River. It was the largest inland oil pipeline spill in the U.S. history. And even the Environmental Protection Agency has all but admitted that up to 168,000 gallons of the oil will remain in the Kalamazoo River indefinitely. Now, in an effort to clean up that river, Enbridge has announced plans to build a dredge facility. The plant will process and clean dirty sediment from the delta near the Morrow Lake. But the owner of the Bells Brewery says that this is too much to swallow. Our environmental consultant tells us this thing is going to stink to high heaven, and the prevailing westerlies go right into our plants. I see this as having the potential of shutting us down. Now, this lawsuit brings both the Inbridge pipeline as well as future plans for the Keystone XL pipeline into question. Pipeline spills, while rare, have much more damaging impacts when they happen inland versus out in the sea because they directly affect the local population. Although the lawsuit is a long shot, the owners of Bell's Brewery say they're willing to stick it out. Well... I mean, how is the official news going with that one? Well, it seems to me that <laughs> fossil fuels are kind of getting a bad rep. I, it's like when you earn the rep, okay, it sticks. It's not just a cliche anymore. It's tragic, yeah. okay? And they're still trying to bang these things through. Can anyone say build a refinery? Well, you know. We could build a green refinery, create 100,000 jobs. Well, you know, Chevron did build a refinery uh -huh. in Richmond, California. <laughs> That should help Canada so much. Uh, but the refinery, well, they check it out. There were issues. More than 200 people arrested and one for battery at a protest in Richmond today. Thousands attended the rally that was held to commemorate the first anniversary of the Richmond refinery fire. While the city of Richmond recently announced plans to sue the oil giant for damages from that fire. Cronforce Alicia Reed was there and brings us more. Some people came here with the intent of getting arrested, and once they crossed the line and got onto the refinery's property, that's exactly what happened. The police captain tells us over 200 protesters were arrested. Well, they really should arrest uh, the people inside of Chevron who polluted and sent 15,000 people to the hospital. After trespassing, the crowd had a chance to leave, but those that refused were put in zip ties and taken away. More than 2,500 people protested in front of the Chevron refinery to promote local resistance to the fossil fuel industry. This rally comes three days before the one-year anniversary of the pipeline explosion. The blaze occurred after a leak in a corroded pipe ignited a fire. Now, protesters are concerned it may happen again. We're asking Chevron refinery here in Richmond to, to upgrade and to make their plant a lot safer. Um, all of the equipment that they're using is corroding away, and it's uh, just a matter of time until the next fire. We can't really afford to have another one. In Richmond, Alicia Reed, Cron 4 News. And, of course, there's the cops all dressed in riot gear, looking like that they're, you know, and with more armor on them than they wear in Iraq. And they're putting handcuffs on little old ladies. Must feel like such a tough guy doing that, eh? 
Oh, yeah, you're protecting that oil company from that grandma. But once again, the, the, the mayor of Richmond is stepping up again. Okay. She's involved in the, in the lawsuit against the refinery. I like this. I like this mayor. Yeah. This mayor person, that's a mayor who stands up, unlike our mayor, who <laughs> reinvests $50 million into the company that... Well, see, Mayor Gray bends so over. <laughs> Well, at least the British Prime Minister isn't in trouble. Oh, well, you know, David Cameron. <laughs> UK Prime Minister David Cameron has called on Britons to back the controversial energy extraction process of fracking. Hydraulic fracturing, to give it its proper name, retrieves shale gas and oil trapped in tight-layered rock formations by blasting water, sand and chemicals at high pressure deep into the ground. In a newspaper editorial, Cameron says not backing the technology would mean a massive missed opportunity to cut fuel bills and create tens of thousands of jobs. He insists it is safe if properly regulated. Many Britons remain sceptical. There have been protests like these south of London. Environmentalists say that fracking can trigger small earthquakes, pollute the water supply and despoil the countryside. Around Europe, worries have led to a ban in France and protests in Germany, while Poland, which has encouraged fracking, has seen disappointing results. And I'm watching online right now about the attitude about his support of fracking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's amazing that, you know, is you can light your water. It destroys your water table I when you do it. I think maybe they should drill a gas well right at number 10 Downing Street. Well, you know that you could get a hot air collector anyways. How about at the grounds of Buckingham Palace? Ah, oh, no, you don't want that kind of grease. It's not the good kind of grease, okay? <laughs> That's the that stuff we don't want to use. Uh, we've got the solutions right here. It's called the Municipal Sustainability Program, and I want you to check it out because on YouTube right now, we're talking about getting oil out of food production. And this is going to work. We dropped off a package to Mayor Walter Gray in Kelowna, British Columbia, Canada. And we're going to be telling you about whether or not he's going to support our initiative to start phasing out poverty food production systems and get rid of the oil problem in Kelowna. I have a prediction on his response. <laughs> Rampant speculation says Fortis. Okay. I'm Darren Howard. And I'm Robert Nisbet. It's so good to have you along. We want to remind you to get informed, get out there. Don't take the official news for what it is. Use your intellect. Don't get spoon-fed nonsense. We've got a great special coming up on the NSA. The Municipal Sustainability Project is online. And Warriors and Thieves, a new documentary coming out in October. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you soon. A lot of people think poverty is a problem for other people in other neighborhoods. But even if you or no one you know is ever affected by poverty, not doing anything about poverty is costing us all. British Columbia has the highest poverty rate in Canada. Not addressing this comes with a price. And this is what it looks like when we do the math. For starters, it costs us $1.2 billion per year to pay for the healthcare costs related to poverty. We've heard a lot lately about how we need to get tough on crime, but some crime could be prevented by reducing poverty, which is linked to crimes of desperation, low literacy rates, and living in unsafe situations. The poverty-related costs of crime in BC add up to $745 million per year. Then. There's the income that the poor might have earned from working if they had access to better supports and training. Or the income that the working poor could have earned if their jobs paid better wages. This is also a loss to our economy, to the collective wealth of our society. And it adds up to as much as $7.3 billion per year. Altogether, it works out to between eight and nine billion dollars every year. This is a terrible deal. And the worst part of this is that it would cost us between three and four billion dollars per year to put an effective poverty reduction plan in place. That's less than half of what poverty is costing us now. You don't have to be an economist to see that it costs more to keep people in poverty than it does to fix the problem. It's just simple math. Not for other people in other neighborhoods, but for all of us.